We praise to you, Heavenly Father, with love and light. And we ask your presence to do well among us throughout this service, to open our hearts and our minds to receive your divine love and wisdom. In your name we ask God. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn is that. Hymn number four. We're going to read the first two verses in the garden. Hymn number four in the garden. First two verses. life, I guess. You just got to deal with life on life's terms and look for God acting in people's lives as best you can and try not to interfere too much with it. Most of the news I got this week was people going in the hospital, people doing bad with their efforts in their lives and just a lot of difficulty. Of course, as a healer and a minister, I, can, I should expect those kinds of things from people because that's what people bring to me. And I was kind of getting a little down on myself about it. Geez, when am I going to hear some good news? Well, that's the profession that I'm in. That's what I've chosen to do with my life, is to try to be positive and helpful and hopeful to people when they need it. And, when they, and that's one of the skills that I've tried to develop. And a lot of how I've developed that is by trying to see without seeing with my physical eyes and senses, try to see with my spiritual senses the things that go on with my eyes open. Most people have to close their eyes and meditate to see with their spiritual senses, but in order to interact in the moment, you have to be able to see with your spiritual senses with your eyes open. And that's a skill that I've tried to develop a lot over the last couple of years. One of them that comes to mind is I live on about a a mile of dirt road, uh, always had most of my life, but no matter where I've managed to live, because I like the country. 
and there was an effort that was put together to recondition the dirt road. Now there's one guy who takes his tractor out there, spends his time, spends his money and his effort to keep the road neat. And he doesn't have to. Nobody pays him to. He just does it because he does it. And if he doesn't do it, somebody else has to do it. Well, where I lived at before, I was that guy. <laughs> Nobody else kept the road up, and if I didn't grade it, it didn't get graded, and it got in pretty bad shape when it rained if somebody didn't keep it up. So this guy does this day after day, and he put together this big effort, uh, asked all of the homeowners along the road about, uh, I think it was 49 people to contribute $300 a piece for the materials, and to pay an operator to use a piece of heavy equipment to grade it out. Nineteen people gave him money. Some of the others wrote him death threats, and honestly, if he touched the road. And this guy, you know, he's, he's, he's just doing it out of the goodness of his heart. So, he puts, the, they, they go ahead with it, put it all down. The day before all this torrential rain starts, now, I don't know how many of you know about dirt roads, but you have to give them a chance to pack down by traffic, otherwise they're quite soft. So for the first day they did it, it was a dust bowl. And for the last week, it's been like an off-road mud track trying to get up and down. So of course this guy, you know he's taking a beat because of what they did there. You know, and everybody's giving them guff. And it just, you know, this guy's trying his best to keep the road up. So, you know, I stepped back and looked at it, and, and what actually happened was not only did the rain come the day after he put it down for a couple of days, but he also, we have a trash truck, which is a big piece of equipment, and a recycling truck, which is a big piece of equipment. Now, the first day it rained, the road was pretty good shape. After those two trucks went over, it became a pure mud track. And then the four-wheelers and the ATVs decided to help it out and burn trails up and make it even worse. So for the last week, it's been like an off-road track, and if you didn't have a truck, you were in trouble. So, and this guy's out there today grading it off, cleaning it up. So, you know, most people would look at that and get mad at him blame him without seeing the actual things that went on with it. So the point of my discussion here is you have to step back from these situations and see the whole picture. Not what gets you angry, not what cranks you up, not what makes you want to react emotionally, but you have to see the bigger picture, the whole plan of how things are going. Otherwise you get too personally involved, you pick on one little part of it and get stuck right there. And that's how the emotion works. It wants to stick you in place, stick you in where you're at, and control you with its thumb on you. That's what emotions do. So, and the, the I got more to talk about with the lecture today. Unfortunately, Dr. Thomas is in the hospital. For those of you that don't know that, he was supposed to lecture today. So I stepped up to give the lecture. I don't want to give away too much of my lecture, but the bottom line is, is in your life, see with your eyes open, see with the spiritual senses, and try to see the bigger picture of everything that's going on, rather than just what's immediately affecting you right here, right in front of you. Thank you for your time. service is uh, comprised of three parts, the healing portion, the inspirational lecture, and the demonstration of spiritual gifts. So we will begin with the healing portion of the service. I would like uh, to ask the healers to take their position, Judy and Marty. For those um, who would like to receive hands-on healing when you hear the sound of this chime. It indicates that a chair has become available, so just go over there and take a seat. And uh, those who would like to 
sit through the meditation. I will be doing uh, the meditation. Let us together uh, say the prayer for spiritual healing, which is in the back of your hymn notes. I ask the great unseen healing force to remove all obstructions from my mind and body and to restore me to perfect health. I ask this in all sincerity and honesty, and I will do it my part. I ask this great unseen healing force to help both present and absent ones who are in need of help and to restore them to perfect health. I put my trust in the love and the power of God. With this thought in your mind, take in a deep breath. <coughs> Relax your body, find a comfortable position where there is no tension on your physical body. Take a few deep breaths. Breathe in and breathe out. Let go of all the thoughts that are occupying your mind. that are disturbing you, any worries, any concerns. With your breath, just exhale, let it go. Bring your focus and your awareness to your breath. to be quiet and not to interfere. Engage in the mechanism of your breath. Feel the flow of your breath. the motion of your breath that is taking you deeper and deeper within. Taking you to a comfortable and peaceful place within yourself. Feels very quiet, calm, and soothing. Why you breathe? Feel the peaceful sensations flowing throughout your mind, your body, your spirit. In the presence of God, mighty I am presence, I now call forth the divine healing energy to be here at this time and to provide each one of us with the healings that we need for our mind, body, and spirit. As we call upon the law of forgiveness, we forgive all those who have hurt us. We forgive those who have disappointed us. We forgive those who have caused us pain and suffering. We 
forgive, and we detach with love. We let go emotions of fear, anger, sadness, disappointments. We let go of whatever is holding us back from advancing the spiritual. We let go of situations, conditions, beliefs that are stopping us from achieving our highest potentials. We let them go to the light, to the light of God. And we surrender to God, God the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, to be in charge of our lives, our existence, our soul, our spirit. While we are here in this physical plane on earth and beyond. In the name of universal Christ consciousness, we ask for protection. We accept it as it's done. While you are breathing peacefully, Feel your consciousness shifting higher. Feel your awareness shifting higher up to your forehead. As you look up, just roll your eyes up and look up above your head. you will see the presence of a brilliant golden light that is just up above your head. Connect with this golden light. As you connect, you feel the energies from this golden light rushing down to the crown of your head. Circulating on the top of your head, around your head. Healing and clearing your mental body. Release and let go of the thoughts and the beliefs that are limiting your highest potentials. Feel this energy circulating at the crown of your head. Feel and see the energy rushing down inside your head, circulating around your brain, your right and left brain, and healing the neurons branching out inside and healing the neurons in your brain. Opening the pineal gland in the center of your two hemispheres. And awakening the divine wisdom within your soul and spirit.
Feel the data from your right brain transmuting to your left brain. Creating the balance. And the energy flowing down to the back of your neck. Clearing your throat. Going down to your shoulders, extending to your arms, see the energy filling your chest, your back. The energy is spreading inside your body, touching the organs, your physical organs, healing the cells, the tissues. Take a deep breath and allow the energy to just move freely inside your physical body. It's branching out. As it moves, it clears the blockages. Circulating around your stomach. Touching your emotional body. Release and let go. All the feelings of sadness. Just let it go, feel this energy washing it away. Feel the motion of this energy moving down to your lower body. There is any area in your physical body that needs healing. Just throw this energy to that area. Just follow the flow of the energy. And take deep breath whenever you can. energy moving down slowly to your feet, going out to the bottom of your feet and extending deep into the ground, anchoring you to the earth. surrounded this beautiful golden circle of light. <coughs> and you are breathing peacefully. this golden circle replicating, multiplying, and generating more and more light around you.
Feel this golden energy flowing throughout your body. Feel you are bathing in this golden healing energy. If anyone is in need for healing at this time, anyone you may know, envision this person with your mind's eye. Whether it's near or far. Envision this person and direct this golden energy to that person. So you going in through the crown and down. Just tune in. Feel the energy reaching that person. Healing. Restabilizing. Physical condition. That individual. collective consciousness. Let us send healings to Dr. Thomas. He is in the hospital. For those who know him, envision Dr. Thomas. And send this healing energy to him. See him embraced with this healing energy. See the energy stabilizing his health conditions. Healing, balancing. See Mother Earth embraced with this healing energy. <coughs> In your breath, bringing you back slowly to your physical body. Feel your physical body renewed, refreshed, 
Come back slowly to your physical body. Come aware of your physical senses. beyond the planets they were born under. 
Today I'd like to speak a little bit about five steps to transformation. This can be used for individual thoughts, for large efforts, for small efforts. This was a, a course that was taught at the Arthur Finley College when I was there one of those years. Teachers from all over the world come there and teach in all different disciplines, all different philosophies. And this was one that they gave. It's five individual steps, and each one is in progression of how it starts. So if you're thinking of making change in your life, whether it's an individual thought, one little thing or one large thing, this is generally the progression that it will go through. And step one is uh, a spiritual impulse. That's how we get the, the inspiration to change. It's an impulse in our minds, something that passes through it gently and puts our attention on something in our lives that we may want to adjust, change, upgrade, however you want to say it. Change comes as an idea or thought to us from spirit, and you need to listen to the currents of change with your heart. So that comes usually in meditation or through some emotional effect that happens to you in your life. It can reinforce something, it can change something. And a lot of times when we look at these things, we've got about a dozen things going on at one time in various stages of this trans uh, steps of transformation. So we need to kind of focus in on one and carry it through to its culmination. So first we get the spiritual impulse. And we kind of start thinking about it, thinking about it, and move into step two, which is unconscious acceptance. So first we hear the impulse, then we accept it as something that we want to work on or that we want to try to bring into our lives or something we want to move out of our lives, whatever the case may be. We accept that that is something that we choose to work on. First we hear the spiritual impulse, we think about it, our unconscious mind argues with our spirit until it accepts the idea. Our unconscious mind or our instincts do not like having suggestions given to it. So here's where the battle comes in, in unconscious acceptance. We have to use meditation at this stage on a regular basis to kind of sort it out because our unconscious mind or our instincts, whatever you want to call them, tend to not like to be changed. They want to stay constant. They want to keep things the way they are. They don't like change. Instinct of survival likes to keep consistent, likes to keep things known and predictable. The spirit mind is almost the exact opposite. The spirit mind is a continual state of change and progression. So we had this little argument back and forth. And the reason meditation is so important at this stage is because our art field is organized at the different levels of vibration. You have the spirit vibration, which is furthest out. Then you have the ethereal vibration, which moves things more into a conscious state of being. And then you have the psychic vibration rate, which is the arbitrator between conscious and spiritual thought and our conscious emotions. And meditation balances these vibrations and keeps the psychic vibration where it should be. And it begins to have this dialogue between the spiritual mind and the physical mind. So it's the arbitrator, it's the interpreter, it's the mediator between the spirit mind and the physical emotional mind. And, and again, like I said, what reinforces this and balances this is a regular meditation. I'm not saying daily. I'm not saying for hours at a time. Just whatever you find comfortable bringing into your life as a daily meditation. I pr personally do about 10 to 15 minutes. That's it. I can't, I can't sit still longer than that. And I, 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 know that you know, I know that back when I was studying the yogic disciplines, an hour and a half to two hours. And I used to do that for about four or five years every single morning at five in the morning. But it, I just can't do it anymore. So 
to 5, 10, 15 minutes as long as it's regular and routine. If it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if it's Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever it is, make it a routine with you. Same time, same day, same day and same place if possible. Because the spirit force will marshal to that point and work with you. They know that that point is being dedicated to them and they will marshal to that point. Whether it's every day, every other day, once a week, as long as it's consistent and they can marshal their energies towards that point. That's the reason for routine and regular meditation that is predictable. So we do this and as our, our the arbitrator begins to make, uh, it goes back and forth. The spirit mind says, be pure, be clean, do this, do that. And the instinctual mind says, there ain't no way under the sun I'm going to do that. <laughs> so it gets to this arbitration point, and the spirit mind will finally say, well, if you can't do that, do this. And the emotional mind will say, well, I might be able to do that. So we get this arbitration back and forth until we hit this thing that's agreeable to the physical and the spiritual at the same time. So now we've completed this unconscious acceptance of how we're going to move forward with this. And I'm liking this to, I want to lose weight. The Spirit says, stop eating sweets, start exercising for two hours a day, and get a lot of sleep at night. Don't watch any TV. This conscious mind goes, Ain't no way under the sun I'm going to be able to do that. <laughs> so it goes back and forth with this arbitration until it ends up 30 minutes of dental exercise a day, an hour less of TV at night, and sweets only on Saturday and Sunday. So we get to this arbitration point where we can accept it, and the spirit mind says, okay, that's, that's cool by me. So then we move forward with this endeavor. We've hit unconscious acceptance with this effort in our lives. Step three is conscious action. Now here again, we move into this challenge between the spirit and the instincts. Spirit impulse plus unconscious action, unconscious acceptance, equals conscious action. We must act or put into plan, put into action a plan. It takes time before we see results of this plan because this is a spiritual endeavor. And usually these plans are with the sense time frame of eternity. The conscious mind goes, gee, this isn't working after two or three days or a week. I don't see anything happening. And the spirit mind saying, give it time, give it time. So you're having this struggle back and forth while you're trying to make this change. But it does take time. But the difference is, when you make an emotional adjustment, it works quickly and in the moment, but that problem comes back next week. It comes back next month. It circles right back around and is right back in your face again, unless you follow a spiritual solution. Spiritual solution takes a lot more time, a lot more effort, and a lot more dedication and trust, but it's a permanent solution. If it doesn't move it beyond, you beyond it physically, it gives you a view to it that you find acceptable, which is going on in your life. And it is a permanent solution. So we have to give it time. It requires continuous effort and application of our plan or thought. Don't reason why, just do it. And that's the uh, Nike symbol that it has, just do it. And that comes from the Odin actual, that symbol comes from the old Greek mythology, Odin, the god of war. And it's kind of, you know, there's the other thing, get her done. So it all kind of... I can't believe you said that. Before you said that, I was thinking that, get her done. That's it. You have to just do it because I'm going to do it. Not because of anything else. I'm doing it. I'm committed to doing it. Don't put a... Don't put a reason on it, just commit to doing it. Because if you put a reason on it, your, your emotional mind is going to find a way to over-reason the reason. You know, and this conscious mind, this, instinct, this emotional mind, is really tricky how it approaches you and gets at you. I'm going to be straight. I'm going to be healthy. 
So the first day, I quit drinking. The next day, I quit eating sweets. And here's the conscious mind saying, yeah, yeah, we're getting it done. Then I decide I'm going to change how I speak. I'm going to change how I act. And four or five days later, I'm right back to my old self. <laughs> so the conscious mind can encourage what you think is a positive path. But you have to do it in moderation. It has to be done in moderation. So don't let that conscious mind shove you like a rocket at something. One step at a time, calmly, con consistently, and with a s slow effort. Make it complete. As with the diet thing, well, I'm going to exercise 10 or 15 minutes a day. I'm going to go out and walk around the block two or three times. And do that until you do that regularly. Then begin to move into more of an exercise routine. Little at a time until it becomes a permanent part of your life and a regular part of your life. So conscious action is another difficult thing where you're constantly back and forth struggling with the emotional and the spiritual. And that's where the commitment of just do it comes in. Don't reason why to do it. Know it's the thing to do. And stick with it regardless of the static and the white noise coming your way from all the other sources. Just stick to it. Know it's the right thing to do. There's a saying that I heard the other day that goes right with this. A wish without a plan is just a dream. So if you have a commitment that you want to make, have a plan to make it come into being. That applies to anything, everything, anywhere. Step four is confirmation. We look for external validation for our success. Signs from spirit are indication the physical world is watching. The currents of life is what it's called. You begin to see change a little at a time. You begin to see the permanence of things. Or you begin to see the, the shifting of your own mind saying things that it has not said before. Saying things that surprise you. Somebody asked you a question that you've always responded to the same to. And something that is completely different comes out of your mouth. And you sit back after the conversation and go, boy, that was an odd conversation. I, I just hadn't thought I thought like that. And it was, a, it was a completely different way of speaking. And you even surprise yourself when these kind of conversation, conversations come about, confirmations. At this stage, something you have to remember is that in spiritual endeavors, a lot of the time, the task, the benefit is trying to make the change. Trying to change yourself. Sometimes you never accomplish the goal that you set before you. But the effort of change produces what you need. The intent to change, the effort to change, can produce a very positive thing within you. Even though you never accomplish the goal that you set for yourself. And the thing that I talk about with that, there's a self-development exercise that I give people in some of the classes I work with. And it's take a word that you don't like using in your vocabulary and try to remove it from your vocabulary. And there's a self-realization process that goes on with that. And rarely do you ever completely remove that word from your vocabulary. But the self-realization that it produces, trying to remove it, turning your perceptions inward on yourself, are amazing what it produces. But again, you have to realize you will not accomplish the goal of removing that word from your life. But, this, but the journey of self-realization is what happens. And that's what happens with these five steps to transformation. The journey of self-realization. You begin to know more about yourself. You begin to realize how you work, how you act. And it's a natural change. It's not something that you have to memorize by rote. Just the task of self-introspection begins to change you without rote, without memory, without repetition. Just the act of looking at yourself to change yourself. 
It will produce change that you can't imagine. The, the thing that is used at this point that I point out as a spiritualist is the act of co-development. Three primary ways of approaching spiritual development in the world today. Subjective development where you subject your mind and ideals to a fixed philosophy. And it doesn't matter what the philosophy is, if it's practiced as a fixed and not a living philosophy, it is a subjective form of belief. Spiritualism can be like that. Christianity can be like that. Judaism can be like that. Any known religion, if it is practiced as a subjective form towards its congregation, can be like that. It's not the theology, it's the way it's taught or, or organized within the church. The second way is singular development. I'm my own authority, nobody outside of me is smarter than me, I'm my own guide, I'm my own way. The third way is co-development. Me, as in the singular method, subjective where I believe in a God but not confined to it, and all of us together, spirit, me, and you, all working together, seeing God's plan within my life, interacting with everybody and everything around me. That's the co-development form of approach. And that can be used with any religious theology out there today. It's not confined exclusively to spiritualism. It is the way the individual themselves approaches the world around them. So co-development is what I choose to use at this stage. Step five is acceptance. The being within has the unshakable knowing of the truth or the rightness of the change. It becomes an inherent part of the belief system. This is where, like I said, you say things and suddenly you realize that I never really thought about this particular thing like that. The inner mind has changed. The inner values have changed. And you become speaking in a completely different fashion less reactionary, less angry, more caring, more loving. You begin to speak in that fashion as things come through you to the world around you. That's an indication of the inherent belief of what you've been trying to bring in changes. Now there's also um, something that you have to remember. The conscious mind tends to, you think you've got it, and the conscious mind says, yeah, you got it, man. You got it. Good for you. And then you walk outside and somebody cuts you off in traffic and you start using sign language. <laughs> yeah, you got it. So you always got to check yourself with these kinds of things. Don't ever let immediate circumstances indicate what your true spiritual development is. Because that's the tool of the conscious mind. That's what the conscious mind tries to turn back on you when you react instinctually or emotionally. Yeah, see, you're not as spiritual as you thought you were. And then you go, you know, maybe that's right. Maybe I'm just don't, not cut out for the spiritual business. I know all about God. I don't need to worry about changing my life. God's there, fine. I'm going to get on with my life. So you got to watch that conscious mind because it's a trickster. It really hybrids itself a lot of times as a spiritual development. But the end result is the same. Back to where I started. Back to where I didn't want to be. Back to the old self. Spiritual progression is a wonderful thing. Spiritual progression cannot be mistaken for the conscious mind. Spiritual progression is, a, is a, an, an uplifting feeling like you get in meditation. It can be done with a handshake. It can be done saying a kind word to somebody. There's no mistaking the spiritual mind versus the conscious mind. You are what you do, and the result is the result. But again, you have to be careful not to allow 
the circumstances and the results of the moment to define your mind for what you think your spiritual progression are. If you care, if you can ask the question, if I've asked, acted spiritually, then you're a spiritual person. Because belligerent people, uncaring people, don't even ask that question. They have absolutely no guilt in their mind. They have absolutely no remorse for their actions. They don't care how they acted. So if you can ask that question, even though you feel guilt about the answer, it shows that you're on your spiritual path. The very fact that you feel guilt shows that you are on a spiritual path. So even though guilt isn't that nice of an emotion, it is a clean and clear emotion. It is a clean and clear feeling. Some things to remember when you embark upon this. I'll just run through the steps real quick again. Step one is spiritual impulse. Step two is unconscious acceptance. Step three is conscious action. Step four is confirmation. Step five is acceptance. Things to remember. What are you prepared to sacrifice for change? What are you willing to commit to for that sense of change? Are you willing to commit to it without reservation? That's what it takes. That doesn't mean, uh, what I always remember when I, when I think about this, when I was in AA, I used to see a lot of people that, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a new life now, I'm going to leave my girlfriend or my wife, and I'm going to start a new life and move forward with all this stuff. So that's not the kind of sacrifice I'm talking about. The sacrifice I'm talking about is personal, individual. What can I commit to? And if it is a, if it is a, a, a just do it type of attitude, that's what you need. And again, don't allow yourself to be moved and have the results gauged by the immediate circumstances. If I fail today, that's, that's okay. If I fail, that's fine. That's all part of it. Thomas Edison was asked one time how it felt to fail a thousand times trying to invent to fill another the light bulb. He told the reporter, he said, oh, I haven't failed a thousand times. I've discovered a thousand ways it wouldn't work. <laughs> so life is like that a lot of the time. Discovering what doesn't work, what you don't want to do, is as important as knowing what you want to do. So stick with it. Have a trust in yourself and move forward with it. Read the signs of your life from the universe. What am I doing right, not what am I doing wrong? Look for synchronicity to occur. Do we all know what synchronicity is? It's two apparently unrelated actions that end up really being related. Something happens over here, it affects something over there. Look for that synchronicity because Coincidence is God's way of working when he wants to remain anonymous. This is not a recipe for all situations. Bad things happen to good people. It's just the way of life. Life on life's terms. Move by it. Have trust in yourself. And realize, like I said, if you can ask the question, if I've acted correctly, you are a spiritual being, regardless of how you act. Do not let circumstances of here and now be a barometer for your spiritual awareness. This is different than looking for signs of change. It's a great life, folks. It's a challenging life, but it's a great life when you stay involved. There's an old sports saying, it doesn't matter if you're winning or losing as long as you're engaged. If you're on the bench or in, your, in, the, in the stands, Watching life, you're not involved. It's better to be involved in losing than sitting in the sidelines watching life. Get in, get involved, and realize that you are a positive person, you're a spiritual person, just by the very fact that you're trying. God loves it. God loves you. God loves me. God loves everybody in the world. 
We have to love ourselves and embrace that change and feel God's presence. See God with eyes open. Look for God with your eyes open, not your eyes closed. And just love yourself and look for the best at every turn. And if you can't look for the best, realize that some days just not adding to your problems is a success. Thank you for listening. some beautiful violin music. There we go. And so, we can welcome yeah. our lovely musician. <laughs> this is such an abundantly resourceful uh, church. Everyone always says to me, well, it's wonderful to be a musician. I say, everybody is a musician. You know, it's just a question, as Reverend Steve said, it's just a matter of doing it. That was beautiful. Beautiful. Um, well, this song that I'm going to play is called Crack in the Sky, and I have brought some music from a friend of mine, Jimmy B. Free, who I met a couple of months ago, who inspired me to order my own seven-string violin. Oh. So, well, let's see if everything works out. So, I set everything up right. I can identify with this lady. She's very technical. It's <laughs> <laughs> spoken like a true musician. It's always going to be good. Mm -hmm. it they did a wonderful uh, music last Sunday. They played together. Matthew and Erica. Good combination. Mm -hmm. How I gone? Thank you. Yes. I think these guys want to give no, you something. No, no, we were saying, yeah. but not one of you said to go with the power. Check out the astronaut. Uh, anybody know if this outlet doesn't work? Just plug it into the power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.